And I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Whether Guthrie or Oklahoma City, Somos, Lexington, Mabel Bassett, I'm thrilled that you're joining us. We are in a new collection of talks called Build His Church. And I'm excited about what God is doing. Jesus said, I will build my church in the gates of hell. Hades will not prevail against it. Amen. That good news, so good news. Um, also, starting October the 20th, for 40 days, we're going to have prayer. 40 days of prayer. Now, for some of you, uh, you're starting to sweat a little bit because you thought I was going to say 40 days of prayer and fasting. We're not asking you to give up food. If God so leads you and your spirit says, then do that. But 40 days of prayer will wrap up on November 28th, which is Thanksgiving Day. Uh, you can get a booklet that is a very small cost out in the lobby in Guthrie, Oklahoma City. You can get this. And the inside is just a, a prayer focus, scripture, and a place that you can journal your thoughts and what God is speaking to you. Uh, if you want to get this for free, you can go online and get it for free. But I hope that you will join us in pray. Because without prayer, we're not going anywhere. And prayer is not a formula. It's the spiritual formation that determines where we're going in life. Amen? Amen. So to God be the glory. Thank you for joining us today. You can be seated right now. If you would, turn in your Bibles uh, with me to the book of Mark, chapter number one. Behind me is a picture of our granddaughter, Skylar. And this past week, Shan and I were in South Dallas for a minister's event, and we had just a moment on one of the mornings to be able to run over and see our granddaughter, and so obviously we're going to take advantage of that. And we took her to the Dallas uh, Arboretum and had a wonderful time. When I got there, I immediately said, hey, we're going to... We're going to invest $10 on a wagon so that I don't have to carry her everywhere on all the walking, that we can pull her everywhere. Well, she had other ideas. And her ideas was that she did not want to sit in the wagon, though we got one picture, but you can tell she's not happy about it. She wanted to pull the wagon. Well, she didn't know where she's going, didn't know how to get there. Um, we had tough enough time for her to keep the wagon on the walkway. And then the wagon was constantly getting, you know, in the way of people that were walking. And so I'm constantly redirecting the wagon. But I knew at some point she would get tired of the effort and give up. And she did. And she finally gave up on the effort and she got into the wagon and made our journey a whole lot better. But there's sometimes individuals, and you could be listening to me right now, that you're trying to pull your life around and you're trying to make it happen yourself. You don't know where you're going. You don't know how to get there because there's only one more person who is the way, the truth, and the life. And his name is Jesus Christ. And part of following Jesus is about saying, I give up on trying to make it happen myself. I trust him with my life because he can do a whole lot better job than I can. In chapter number one, there's a common theme in the scripture about Jesus inviting people to follow him. Listen to what it says. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also, say it with me, followed him, leaving their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men. Uh, flip over to chapter number two. And notice what it says, verse 13. Then Jesus went out to the shore, lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and said with me, followed him. 
In your notes, I want you to notice, it says that to follow Jesus is to respond to his call to believe the gospel and repent. Then live a life that obeys his followings and surrenders to following his example. In fact, let me go ahead and give you a step-by-step -step on what it means to follow Jesus. It is confession plus repentance equals following Jesus. This is key to understand because confession is an admittance. It is literally come to the realization that you cannot do this yourself. I think we all understand if, if you're ever going to change your physical health, you've got to acknowledge where your health is and, and you've got to start there. You've got to start. If you're an addict, you've got to acknowledge, because I've been there, people don't want to acknowledge where they are. We've got to all acknowledge that we fall woefully short of God's standard that was established and we need help. And that help only comes through Jesus. But then the second is equally as important is that then you've got to repent. And to repent is to literally turn around. It is that I'm headed this way and now I'm going to turn and go this way. It is a complete turnaround that you were once going after your own wants, your own desires, and now you've surrendered your life completely to Jesus and you're following him. So following Jesus is about confession plus repentance equals following him. I want to pray. And if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, I call you to confess and to repent and start following him. And when you do, the first step of discipleship is water baptism. What is happening inside of you personally needs to go public to a world and we're ready for you. And just let us know and we want to celebrate that. And that is not something that is given as a suggestion by Jesus a recommendation. It is a command, and it's something that he exampled for us, and we should do that. Father, we pray right now that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will speak to us and teach us today what it means to follow after you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. When I was 16 years of age, I uh, grew up on a farm, and I'm out in one of the fields on a very extremely hot day, and as I'm working, I get stung multiple times. And as I get stung, no big deal, hurt, yes, but I've been there before. Uh, I don't know what happened that day. I don't know if it was the temperature, a combination of things. But about 10 minutes later, I started feeling really bad. And I realized something's going on. I just don't feel good at all. And so I left that field. About 15 minutes later, I get back to the house. And I go in to take a cold shower. I take a cold shower. I feel better after I get done with the shower. I put on my clothes. I did not even think about looking in the mirror, but as I walked out, my mom is coming into the house, and the moment that she sees me, she says, oh, no, what happened to you? And I immediately realized, oh, obviously, there's something going on on the outside of me. So I walked in, looked in the mirror, and I saw that I was swollen. I had broken out, and I had noticed that my breathing began to be a little bit labored. So as my mom realized that something's going on, we get in the car. She drives me to the local clinic in our small town uh, to visit the doctor. Well, we get there. The doctor's not there. He has actually gone to the nearest uh, city, which is about 25 minutes away, and he is there at the hospital. The one ambulance has actually been sent out on call, and it's not available. Uh, there's usually two nurses. There's only one nurse there that day, and the one nurse does the vital signs on me, and after doing the vital signs on me, looks at me and my mom and says, you need to get to the hospital immediately, and we do not have an ambulance, and he may have only 20 minutes to live. Okay. That changes the game. We got a 25-minute drive with 20 minutes to live. My mom immediately just like went into like, oh no mode, and literally it changed. She's the one driving me to the clinic now I'm the one that's dying, but helping her back to the car because she's about to faint. I get her in the car, loaded up, and then I go to the other side. Now, my mom, if you're ever with her and, and she's an experience, you will hear her saying the name of Jesus again and again. Not just as a term of endearment, it's a, it's, a, it's a term of power. She believes the name of Jesus is greater than anything. And so she is all the way to the car, and while we're in the car, she is saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then she'd be speaking in tongues, too. And then she'd say, Jesus, Jesus. And she would speak in tongues, and she'd say, Jesus, Jesus. And while we were driving, and, and we, we made the 25-minute trip in about 15 minutes, okay, because my life is at stake here, 
uh, she is over there with a hanky over her face, laid back, saying, Jesus, Jesus, and praying in tongues. And then every once in a while, she'd pull off the hanky and look at me, and she'd go, ah, and put the hanky back over her. I guess that that meant God had not answered her prayer yet, and I still looked like I was dying. The title of my message today is, I've Decided to Follow Jesus. And what does it look like to follow after Jesus? Look at Mark chapter number three and verse number 13. It says, after where Jesus went up on a mountain and he called out the ones he wanted, look at this, to go with him. Following Jesus is a journey. It's an adventure. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. They were to, get these words, accompany him and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. So three things on following Jesus, it's to partner with him, accompany him. It is to preach about him, out to preach. And then giving them authority, it is about power from Jesus. So first, it's to partner with Jesus. And so when I use that term to partner with, it literally means to engage into activity with somebody else, to share something together. Now, when we think of partnering with somebody, you may think of a 50-50 business venture or maybe a 60-40 business venture where they do their share and I do my share. But I want you to understand clearly when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not some 50-50 agreement that you come to. <laughs> this is about surrendering your life completely to him, understanding that he is the one that makes things work. This past Sunday was not, was uh, historical. Last past Sunday was historical in NBA basketball. Uh, it is the first time that a father and a biological son played in an NBA basketball game together. It, it is amazing to think about. I mean, LeBron James, who is arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. And then you have his son, Bronny, who is actually playing with him. Now, some would doubt that Bronny should even be there because he's not talented enough. He's not good enough. He's not whatever. But let me just say in that game uh, this past week, uh, they both combined for about a half. It's a preseason game. They, they combined for playing about a half of the game. It just in the half of game, here's what they got combined. They got 19 points, seven rebounds, four assists, and two blocks. And that's a half a game. Now, granted, Bronny only had two rebounds, and his daddy had everything else. Now, hear me. I, I don't know whether Bronny should be, should not be there. But I, I, I do know something about the spiritual world. And I do know something about you and something about me, that none of us belong and none of us have contributed that we are deserving of anything. At least Bronnie got two rebounds. You haven't established anything that has earned your right to be called a child of God. But yet our heavenly father looked at us who were undeserving and willingly gave up his son to step out of eternity and step into time. And then Jesus willingly laid down his life and then three days later kicked out the end of a grave. And they have called us now sons and daughters of God and none of us deserved it, but God has called us into partnership with him. That is wonderful to consider. I, I was thinking about this in regards to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And, and I, I believe in the second coming of Jesus. I believe that he is going to reestablish everything. But here's the, something about rapture theology. It's relatively new to the church over the last 150 plus years. So for those 1,800 years after Jesus' ascension back to heaven, they weren't thinking about fleeing. You know what they were thinking about? Redeeming and reclaiming a world that had been lost. Now, sometimes we get so caught up in our departure and get out of here that we fail to take dominion over what God has given us. Oh, somebody. We got a responsibility. Notice what it says in Genesis chapter one. This is what was given to Adam and Eve right at the beginning. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. But here's the thing. So sometimes we get so focused on what does that mean to govern? Because that was lost at 
when, when Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God. But when Jesus came and broke the curse and reestablished and sent us the power of the Holy Spirit, you know what we should be doing? We're going on mission to continue what Jesus started, to bring hope to the hopeless, to set at liberty those that are held captive, to give sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, to restoring of marriages, to give hope to people and to bring peace on earth. That's what we should be doing. What does that mean? It means having authority over your own life. It's easy to talk about what other people don't have. Come on. Have you taken dominion over your own life? Your physicalness, your, your, your finances, your emotions, your mental state. Come on, your spiritual life. We've got everything for life and godliness through Jesus Christ. And also, it's about reflecting God's character by showing the world what Jesus looks like. Uh, Acts chapter number 11 they went about and they were called Christians because they looked like Jesus. Now we say we're Christians and we don't look like Jesus. We got it backwards. Let's let the world tell us, man, you look, you look like this guy I've heard about. Jesus. Matthew chapter 12. Shannon sent me this this week. And this is Jesus telling his followers what he would be like. He's given the prophetic word from the book of Isaiah about what his ministry and life would be like. It says, this is fulfilled by the prophecy of Isaiah concerning him. Look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Notice these words. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering, flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious and his name will be the hope of the world. What does that speak to you and me? See, Jesus is trying to awaken him to the reality that he is the Messiah, but not the Messiah that they think he is. He is not the Messiah that's going to come and just overthrow the Roman government and establish his kingdom and rule with a rod of iron and make people to do everything he wants. No, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm doing things a little differently than you think because I'm going to rule, but I'm going to reign differently because I'm going to bring love and healing and hope and restoration and give people something that's going to be of eternal value, not of earthly value. You see, it's so easy for us to get so focused on the White House that we miss out on God's house and being responsible Christians because while Jesus is coming again, he told us to occupy till he comes. And that means that we are to govern. It means we go into the schools and make a difference, that we're light and darkness, that we go to our workplaces and we bring hope to the hopeless. It means that everywhere we go, we're spreading the good news of Jesus Christ and offering them the eternal hope that only he can give. So what does it mean? Again, following Jesus, confession plus repentance equals following Jesus, which equals a life of surrender and obedience to him. So partner with Jesus, but then also we are called to preach about Jesus. I grew up in a family that was, I was blessed. My dad was a farmer. My mom was secretary at the school. My grandmother, my, just people on fire for God. They're not in ministry. But yet, they were constantly witness to people, seeing people come to Christ, inviting them to the house of God, prayer times at our house, helping people through issues, praying for those that were struggling with things. I, I, I just knew that my, my dad would pray every night a prayer that I would hear him pray from Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, he who wins souls is wise. I saw my uncle Boyce that worked six days a week hard on the farm and then go to Sunday school on Sunday morning and then Sunday church and then have Sunday night services too that were different experiences. And then all through the afternoon would go out after lunch and he would go door to door knocking on doors, offering how he could pray with people and letting them know if you're not a follower of Christ that he would introduce them to the savior of the world. And come on, well, we, we don't have to wait for, you know, and just talk about the Jehovah Witnesses going door to door. No, 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 we're witnesses of the saving power of Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility to take this world the good news. The word in the Greek for preach is caruso, which means to proclaim, to declare, to announce, or to herald a message. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus says, and he told them, go into all the world and sit with me, preach. You want to say it with me? Preach the good news to everyone. 
You see, to preach is to witness. And you've got to have an encounter with God to have something to talk about. And in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, Jesus said, go until you be endued with power and how. You know what he said? Partner with me until you be endued with power and how. What was the power? The Holy Spirit. Then you will be my witnesses. So you partner with me, spend time with me. You will be empowered by me and you won't help but preach of me. Witnessing to a world. You see, we talk about the things that we think about most. So consider what is on your heart and what you're talking about most. That's what you're spending the time doing. When you spend enough time with Jesus, you can't help but preach about him. When you spend time with Jesus and you're worried about, no, what do I say? How do I witness? No, no. When you come out of time with Jesus, you will have something worth saying and worth hearing. We used to have something in church called testimony services. If you're 40 years of age and you were raised in church plus older, you probably remember these testimony services. It's where we would let people just stand up and they would say what Jesus has been doing in their life and put the devil in his place. At least that's what it should have been. Sometimes it might not always been that way. But, but let me just tell you, it's one thing to do it among believers. It's another thing to have the confidence and the courage and the strength and the power to go out to a world and share with them the good news of Jesus Christ and how he is transforming your life. See, we're called fishers of men. This is about knowing Jesus and making him known by bringing the God's kingdom of hope, deliverance, and freedom to everyone, everywhere. And one of the parting words that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 28 is these. Therefore, go... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It could be that the greatest evidence that you are following Christ is that others want to follow you because you are following Christ. Let that sink in for just a moment. Who is following you because you are a follower of Jesus? So partner with Jesus and then preach about Jesus. And finally, you got to have this to do the first two. It's power from Jesus. I hope that you're reading along with us because in reading plan number one, we're in Mark chapter number five today. But in chapters one, two, and three, it goes on again and again. Jesus is asking people to follow him but his power is on display. First is the story of the demonic that he sets free. And then Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever and in bed, and he goes and prays for his mother-in-law, and she is raised up, and she is healed, and she gets up and just cooks a meal. And then people begin to hear about Jesus from everywhere and begin to invite him to come. And they begin to send the sick and the diseased, and he begins to heal everybody. But notice what Jesus says to his followers in John chapter 14. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even say it with me, greater works because I am going to be with the Father. I've been saying this for a few weeks now and I'm gonna continue to say it, that you have not met all of God yet. Is anybody listening to me? None of us have met all of God yet. There's still more that God wants to do in your life and through you. The greater works that he talked about are available for us today. For those that will partner with him and those that will stand on the word of God and preach about him, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power available for you and me today. Notice again what it said in verse number 20 of Matthew 28, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. How is he with? He left. No, he's with us because he sent the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of Jesus in us. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Let, let, let me encourage you, parents, get your kids to fall retreat. I grew up a very busy life with the farm, and, and I love to play sports too, but I'm telling you, everything stopped. When camp came around and a retreat came around that was spiritually based, as my parents made no ifs, ands, and buts, that's where you're going to go. Because here's what they understood and valued. 
They valued an encounter with God more than playing baseball, football, basketball, or any other activities. And they told us we're going to go. And let me tell you something. There was moments that I did not want to go, but there was a moment in the presence of God that transformed my life. And from then on, because once you've had a taste of heaven, and once you've had a taste of an encounter with God and the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing that this world is going to offer is going to suffice because you've tasted of the spiritual things. And you want that more than, I would get your kids to fall retreat. Mark chapter number 16, verse number 17 says, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe they will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt, hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Sign me up for that. Sign me up. One of the things that I encourage you to do often is to respond to God's word through the message that's preached and also through worship. There's something powerful about the altar. And the altar is, it can be a physical place, but it's, it's a place where you lay your life down in obedience to God and surrender to him. Oftentimes when somebody else is preaching, I'm the first one down at the altar, almost every time. Why is that? Because I'm the pastor and supposed to set an example for you? Yeah, maybe rightly so. But I didn't pastor. I wasn't even on church staff till I was 34 years of age. And I can go all the way back to when I was a late teens, when God touched my heart. And from then on, it's game on. I don't care what's being preached about. I want to get in the altar and talk to God because I have not met all of God yet. And I want to meet more of him. And right now there's individuals listening to me that you need the power that comes from Jesus in your life. Because there are chains in your life that need to be broken. And let me just tell you, there's a song that I like to sing in my head sometimes, that there's power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I'm telling you, if you need chains broken off of your life right now, or if you realize you need to come in partnership with Jesus Christ, or you realize that you're not preaching about him like you should, I want you just to stand to your feet if you know God's speaking to you right now. And I'm not gonna sing that again. Matter of fact, I need, I need, to, I need to bring Crystal out. Crystal, where's Crystal? Crystal, would you mind doing this for us? Put you on the spot here. Because we all have giftings, right? We all have giftings. And... Um, if you haven't noticed, my gifting is not with singing. But there's some people that are highly anointed to sing. And as she began to sing this, if you want and you need the chains to fall off of your life, there's power in the name of Jesus. If you know you need to have more time at the feet of Jesus, come on. Some of you need to run to the front and just lay on the altar and just begin to talk to him or come and stand. Come on, let, let God begin to speak to you. Our prayer team is gonna be available for anybody too, but come on, let's begin to respond. There's power in the name of Jesus. Let's don't, let's, let's don't miss this moment to let God do his thing. Crystal? There is power in the name of Jesus. Come on. There is power There is power in the name of Jesus. Come on, church. That name. Break every chain. If you need prayer, get up here. Break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, there is. Oh, 
come on if you need healing, if you need hope, if you need deliverance. There's an army rising up. That's the church. That's the church. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break every chain. 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 Come on, God's not done in this house right now. God's speaking to individuals that need to come for prayer. Our prayer team is going to be available. Don't let this moment pass you by. There's power from Jesus available to set you free, whatever it is. And if anything, you, you have not met all of God yet, and God wants to show up and reveal himself to you in new ways. Come on, let's enter in right now. Let's go after Jesus. Would you lift your hands across this place, begin to respond, and let's worship Jesus. Let's sing it again, Crystal. Crystal.